I'm John Wilker, the organizer of 360 Edit. I hope you enjoy this session recording, but first I wanted to mention one thing. We've served the community since 2009, and over the past few years we've had to take on debt in an effort to keep the conference alive. After several unforeseen challenges, not the least of which is a pandemic of indefinite duration, we've had to make the hard choice to end the conference as we're now facing over $100,000 in debt. As a result of requests from the community of how they can help, we've created a GoFundMe campaign. If you're inclined and able, please consider donating to help keep 360 iDev going. The QR code after this will link you to the campaign. Thank you. Enjoy the recording. Uh, for a while now, uh, we actually got the help of Tim Condon involved with this. Uh, maybe you know him. He's uh, doing the uh, Vapor open source project as lead maintainer. Uh, I want to add some authentication and authorization as well, so it's a nice full-fledged example. I'm going to do some live coding. Also, I'm jet-lagged, so <laughs> this is going to be fun. Um, so yeah, first, a little bit about me. I'm uh, Jeroen Leenarts. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I'm a developer relations manager at Stream, specifically targeted at developer experience. Uh, I have a podcast, App Force One. You should look it up. It's for iOS developers. Also wrote a book a while ago. I've been doing software development since, I guess, too long, maybe 20 years. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, now's the time. Grab your phone, scan this one. You will have an instant uh, follow on my uh, App Force One uh, profile on Twitter. And uh, at the end, I will have some links available as well for you to have a look at, and uh, so that you can get access to all the source code and all the samples, so that you can play around with it yourself. Um, so yeah, why talk about building a VaporSwift backend integration? Uh, it's an interesting question. Oh, I forgot this bit. Let's go back. Why talk about a bit building a VaporSwift backend integration? Um, for a number of reasons, because the main language that you use on iOS is of course Swift, and Using a backend that's written in Swift as well is uh, really cool because it allows you to stay within, within the same programming language and you could potentially reuse logic on your front end and your back end. So just a little bit about Stream. Uh, we have a chat SDK. Um, if you want to build chat into your product, come talk to us, come talk to Kimmy or Nash or me. They're just sitting here at the front, but we will be at the booth for the rest of the conference a lot of the time. And uh, it's, a, it's a way that you can integrate chat in your product really fast, like a couple days instead of months or weeks. And uh, we have a free trial available, and you do not need a credit card to get started. Uh, really cool, we have UI components available so that you can get started really quickly. Uh, and you can build any chat use case that you'd like. Uh, we're trusted by many companies. Some uh, icons here, you might recognize a few. Not going to name all of them, but uh, that will be really long asked. Sorry, that will be really long winded. Um, so, why use Paper Swift? Uh, it's a web framework written in Swift, as already mentioned. Uh, you can do backends, web apps, and APIs and HTTP servers in Swift. And the nice thing is that you can stay with your primary language that you're using for content, most likely as well. They've been around for a while, 2016 has been the first version, and almost every year they've been releasing uh, major versions initially, and they're now on version four for a few years. And uh, I think I've heard Tim talk about them working, already worked on a version five uh, of uh, Vapor Swift, but it's still a bit of a ways out before they actually start releasing it as uh, generally available. Uh, so why Paper Swift? It has a small footprint on the server, so it's very memory and CPU efficient, especially if you compare it to scripting languages. Uh, it has a quick startup time, so if you use it in a uh, function as a service type of setup, uh, there's no just-in-time compilation involved. Uh, there's hardly any warm-up. You just call your function, and it's available much quicker than, for instance, a Python-based uh, function or even a Java-based function because of the garbage collector and uh, yeah, just a warm-up time of a virtual machine. Um, also, it's much more deterministic in the behavior that you get because the memory allocation and deallocation is, is done with ARC, which is deterministic in, uh, in its behavior compared to a garbage collector just start collecting whenever. 
Uh, and of course, as I already mentioned, you can work full stack in Swift. So what am I going to be building today uh, with a lot of sample code? It's going to be a VaporSwift backend that will integrate with Google, GitHub, sign in with Apple. I have some brackets on that because I cannot do a site association with local host, so I cannot demo that. And we will integrate with the stream uh, backend. There's going to be a number of things that I will be needing. A VaporSwift project, of course. So that's going to be the main topic of the talk. A database, because we need to store stuff. But that's just in a Docker image, so not very interesting right now. Uh, several Swift packages will be involved. And you need an account with some of the backend services. So let's get started. First of all, I want to check, can everybody read this one? Is it big enough? Yeah? So I'm not going to be doing like a ton of things in the terminal, but still, it's good to have it there. I already have um, Paper installed with Homebrew and uh, already checked that it's working. So I'm just going to clone some uh, code there. Hope I'm on the right Wi-Fi. So what I just did is I made a directory, CD'd into it, and I basically created a new Vapor project uh, on uh, a template repository that we have available. And I'm going to open up the package file so that we can switch to Xcode, so that we have a nice ID. I'm going to check if it's legible again. Needs, needs to be bigger, right? It's always fun during live presentations. What does the font size people want? Uh, let's try 36. There we go. Let's open up just a random file to see if it's good. This is legible, right? All right, let's get rid of the sidebar. We don't need it today. And go with the package file. Uh, there's a number of things already in here. Uh, that's, of course, the Vapor Swift dependency, some database related stuff for Vapor, a driver for Postgres. So we're going to do something with JWT, and we're going to do something with Imperial, which is a nice helper uh, for some things that we want to do. Let's see what's next. So we need to make sure that we have a specific package available as well that's been created by Stream. And this is a small uh, utility framework that helps you integrate with our backend. And that's open source and available. Need to make sure that it's also part of the execution target. And then we're gonna get started with some code. So what are we adding first is to the configure function at the bottom, and we're gonna be doing a few things. First of all, we're getting the stream access key. This is like a credential that you need, and an access secret. Sounds very much OAuth-like, and we need to make sure that those are configured. Yeah, there we go. I'm wondering something here. Yeah, that should be good. And once we've done that, we need to go work on our product. That's the auth controller. And we need to like look around, around here a little bit because we're going to be dealing with a number of routes. They're grouped in auth, so that we have a register call, a sign-in with Apple call, a login call, something related to uh, Google sign-in, something related to GitHub sign-in. And I need to make sure that I modify my login response to be able to deal with a few things. And I really feel the jet lag right now because I really feel that I'm cross-eyed or I need better glasses. So what we're doing here is we're extending the login response with a stream token property so that we can use that later. I'm wondering if I forgot something in the configure. 
Yes. I was seeing that error and I was like, hey, in my trial runs, that error at the bottom here was not there. So that should now be disappearing in a while. Um, so I added this uh, stream token property. I'm going to be building because this takes a while. And I need to like explain a few parts actually quite quick. So we can look into the auth controller. Basically what this class does is uh, handle a lot of the uh, details of the authentication workflow. So I need to fix the first error in this file because this thing says it needs a stream token as an argument, which is kind of logical. So we get the stream token from the username with the help of the stream class here. And we make sure that it gets uh, put into the re in the login response. Need to get rid of this because that's not correct anymore. And let's see, this should be, this should be good, yeah. So what this code does is it generates a token that is specific for the stream backend and then stores it so that we can use it later again. Part of OAuth is, of course, also that you do some uh, redirection. So we need to update this as, well, this as well. So remove the old redirect URL and delete it. And make sure that we add the stream token as a, a query string property to that as well with the JWT token so that it gets sent to the uh, authentication flow. So to get all of this started, of course, you will need to do some things on Google and with GitHub to get like your OAuth um, configuration set up there. And I have a nice blog piece available that details all these steps, but just going through that here live on stage would be a bit much because it's just making sure that you go through a few forms on uh, GitHub and on uh, Google. Uh, but in the end of my presentation, there will be a link to a blog article that also details those steps so that you can actually get started with those pieces of the puzzle as well. I also need to make sure, as we've seen before, that I also add some credentials to my configuration because these things are being taken from the environment. That basically means that I have to make sure that those are indeed configured on my environment. So let's start doing that. We need to make sure that they're on the target as environment variables. This is going to be taking a few steps here. Not going to do it all manually. We need to do the second one. These are all test credentials, by the way. So probably going to be deleting them sometime later today. That's the fourth one. One, two, three, four. Oh, I did what I did this one twice, right? The fourth one. And then there's the fifth one. And the final one. Well, let's just throw in the, the stream credentials for this sample as well. Because then we have the and I have the entire environment configured. As I already mentioned, I'm going to be skipping signing with Apple because of the site association I cannot do with localhost. Um, one thing I do need to do is to run my database. Uh, it's, all, it's really nice. It's a script created with, uh, with Swift from the command line. Oh, I have to say what it needs to do. Please start my database. Database started in Docker, so that's good. We now have a database PostgreSQL running. And I think I can run the project now. Yeah. It should now all get started without much issue. Let's check on the console. Notice, yeah, it gives me a warning that I didn't customize my working directory. I'm not using any static assets that need to be served by the vapor process. Otherwise, uh, if you use uh, Vapor, 
you have to configure that here in your arguments, uh, or was it, I think it's the options, you need to make sure that you put the correct working directory there because otherwise uh, the uh, process cannot find your static images and assets, but I'm not using those today. So, um, any questions so far about this bit? So this is the back end. Sure. Uh, I should do, and then local. I need to make it a little bit bigger. Because it's, it's a fun thing you can do with uh, Swift on the command line. Uh, where's the start? Because you can do a hash bang uh, in, a, in a Swift file. Really. And if you have this, and of course you have the Swift um, utility, command line utility installed, you can just do this. And then with some restrictions, basically foundation stuff, uh, you can just script away whatever you want. And you can just start the process in this instance, for example, because we're just doing some things with putting together a shell command and then running the shell command and waiting for the results and reporting on the results uh, in this little utility. It's just, you know, just convenient. It's part of the sample code, so if you want to have a look at it, it will be available on GitHub. Um, the next step, of course, since it seems that uh, I'm running the project correctly, is to get started with the iOS code, and I've made this easy for myself. I'm still in the right directory. I'm like now filling some time because I needed to download some things, but it's already there. So this is a little sample project that I put together. Uh, that's basically an iOS application that will connect to our local host backend, and we need to add some things to that. Let's get rid of the preview, because then we, otherwise it's like, especially with this large font, I want to see code and not the preview, because the preview is not going to be very interesting today. Uh, line 26, if I'm correct. That's like big. Let's make it bigger. All right, line 26. So basically, what I will be presenting is a user interface with a couple of buttons. So uh, a username, password field, login button, sign in with, sign in with Apple, and a sign in with GitHub button. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, we're just going to wire up these buttons and make sure that uh, I can at least show some example of working code at the end of my demonstration. And then, of course, if you want to look into this more yourself, all the code is available. We have documentation. There's a nice blog article. You can really dig in yourself, and you can just, uh, it's all open source available. So if you want to do something with GitHub or Google or sign in with Apple in your own code, feel free to like uh, have a look at it and uh, come up with uh, the fix for your situation. Um, so let's continue. I have to open the login view model. I, I did like prepare my presentation with like this very rigid scripting because uh, I, I'm like jet lagging with like an eight hour time difference. And I wasn't comfortable with like doing the live coding like really live. So there should be a login function here somewhere. Let's go there. Yeah, it has a nice fatal error in there. Good practice, right? <clears throat> so let's paste it in there and see what we actually do here. Um, so basically, if you hit this login button, uh, it will put together a login string. Um, make sure that your username and password is encoded in it. That's what you see here, like basic uh, authentication, really. Um, not sure if that's the best practice, but hey, it works in my case, right? Uh, and then we post it, and then we start handling it. So if it fails, we should get a nice error message. And now have any least. I didn't touch anything. Indication on screen that uh, something has gone wrong. So, uh, yeah, and of course, it's JSON encoding that we need to do here and there. So, replace that bit. Then we have a completion handler. I need to put in some code there as well. 
So, did I get the correct one? Yeah. Yeah, so what this does, it will take the information that it has gotten from the vapor backend, and it puts together a new request that can be used to authenticate with uh, the stream backend. So that's the, um, how you should look at this, is you have your client and you have your service provider, in this case stream, because I just happen to work at stream. And uh, you need some server side components to make sure that, I shouldn't be moving around, I think. <laughs> there it is. And uh, it has some server side component that actually does the authentication with you as the end user and then make sure that you are actually who you say you are, and then with a server backend key, go toward the service provider's backend, in this case stream, and gets the credential that can actually be used by the client to start a chat session in this case. So that's what we're actually doing here. So we're putting together a new authentication call with a token, and we are making sure that this stream backend, and I hope I can, I hope the microphone stays connected, and that I, I'm, I'm like afraid to move now, actually. I'm like really static at my desk now. Um, so yeah, what this code does, it, it picks the details from this uh, response and puts it in a new call and prepares it to be sent to the stream backend in this connect user call, because that's uh, a call that actually makes sure that the user has the correct information and that the session is being started. Actually, if you use stream as a product, um, calling this connect user call actually makes that there's an active user on our backend. So, and we charge by the monthly active user. So this call, if you, if you use a product. So somebody asked that yesterday at our booth. Now you know. Um, so I need to do something with the OAuth sign-in view model as well. Uh, I must say OAuth is a very protocol that is kind of finicky. You have to get the details right and make sure that uh, you have everything in the right place so that it actually works and it's quite easy to mess up. And this is related to basically the same thing we did earlier the, the, in the login function, but this is the same, but then for either Google, GitHub, uh, to actually make sure that we do the all auth flow with those uh, backend provi uh, authentication providers. As you might notice, there's no signing with Apple in these, but the signing with Apple is in the other, uh, is in the blog post so that you can also look at that if you want. So what this actually does, it makes sure that it creates the correct URL for uh, Google or for GitHub. So these are just the specified, uh, sure that you have those. Uh, we have a scheme and that scheme is being used for the callback from the web authentication flow back into the app. So that's uh, stream vapor, colon, hash dash, et cetera. And then we will try to do a web authentication session with all these parameters that we set up. And the A's web authentication session is what actually makes sure that there's a web session ongoing within your app, but actually in a separate process so that you can do the login with your own password provider so that you are securely logging in without sharing your credentials with this application directly. And then uh, the results are picked up if successful and it is being presented on the user. So the session start is really what kicks off the process and make sure that this web view is being displayed to the end user. Um, I think I need, to, this is one I'm not sure of, but I think I need to like build it. Ah, uh, yes, live demos. That's related to the vapor demo. Let's clean it and build it again. I'm getting back to resolution errors. That's an interesting one. Uh, update to latest package version. That always does some magic. Have a nice. 
This is the interesting bit with Xcode. There's always caching going on. I must say I had like uh, quite a lot of luck with Xcode thus far during this live demo. Missing patch. That's so weird. Let's like kill Xcode. No. Yes, let's kill Xcode. If Xcode is not working, you just start it again, right? So I have to make sure that I start this thing. This is my backend. And while that's working, I will open my favorite project, run it again. It's still indexing. Building, pre-planning. But at least it's not erroring out immediately. So let's hope that we're good now. It's, it's amazing how much Xcode can actually compile if you restart it again for no reason, apparently. It should be there cached, but build successful. It's magic, right? <laughs> I think this is something as iOS developers we're all familiar with, with Xcode just um, not doing what you are wanting it to do. So literally the only thing I did was restart Xcode and update my packages, which is fun. Where you have a user interface. So what I have here is basically a username password field with a login and a sign in with Google. I'm gonna press this Google button. And if I'm correct, this will actually fail initially. And I will tell you why. Because it doesn't say it fails here. But it's doing a lot of stuff, right? You know what's strange thing is this is actually different behavior than what I had like an hour ago. <laughs> it's amazing. It seems like it's retrying all the time. Because what's actually going on, the account that I'm using to sign in with Google is my uh, personal Google account, and it is Jeroen.Lenaerts. And the stream backend does not accept a dot in a, a user ID in its backend. So, and it's trying to send that incorrect username as an ID. So I need to make sure that I replace this dot with something else so that at least the backend uh, doesn't uh, complain about that. So I need to go to the login view model. Login view model, not the login view. And then I think it was like line 93. That's username being used as an ID. And I, if my notes are correct, I can just outright replace this. And it's, you wouldn't do this in production, right? I'm just replacing uh, the dots with underscores. And let's see what this does. It, it's, I, I actually have surprisingly few gremlins so far with my demo. No, I think something broke in the back end. Oh, wait a second. Maybe it is important to do that. Just trying another API key. It's always good, right? It's always good to have backups. Continue. Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, I cannot show a chat message here, but trust me, if there would be a chat message here, I could actually work on that. This sample code uh, should have had like samples in this backend. Maybe Nash can add some. No, you can't. Uh, and, but the default behavior of our SDK is that the adding of channels is not available. You have to program that yourself, and it was out of scope from a demo. But actually, what I now did in this little button press is actually open AS web authentication session. Uh, I already was signed in on the Safari browser with my credentials, so it was already pre-cached, and I could just, you know, you saw it, I pressed the login button, and it immediately falls through. But it did, did actually connect to Google, get a token, get that back, 
and then used the, those uh, credentials on the backends with the Vapor uh, implementation, uh, send it there, and that can then just authenticate me and get me uh, an stream chat token, which is fetched from the stream backend. And that's being given back to the application. The app then takes that uh, chat API token and was able to connect to the stream backend. So it did a connect user and it can start chatting now. Um, and it's, it, I'm surprised by the amount of code that are needed to, to get this working, the, the, the few lines of code really. Uh, it is of course, if you look at the, the line items that I have here, there's much more detail involved, but uh, I'm already like more than half an hour in. And yeah, I'm just ready to take some questions uh, uh, on this. And then if the questions are done, I wanna wrap up and then make sure that uh, people can find all the sample codes online because it's a working example of Vapor, front-end, and stream uh, that's just available with a nice block item attached to it as well so that you can get started uh, with this yourself with just GitHub login and Google sign-in and sign-in with Apple. And it's so confusing that they have different names, basically. But uh, yeah, are there any questions really thus far? The question is, do you have any tips on debugging? Um, well, basically, if you use Vapor, it is uh, convenient for debugging purposes to, to run it in Xcode. I know a lot of developers doing Vapor development tend to use Visual Studio Code, uh, but then the debugging uh, is not as full-fledged as you would have with uh, Xcode. But the problem with Xcode is, of course, it takes a bit more finesse to, to, to get the debugging working and to get it running compared to just running uh, vapor from command line. And there's actually an interesting development that recently happened uh, on the uh, on the swift.org site. And that's that there's now actually a Swift on the server page available there. This is being maintained by uh, Tim Condon. And what's really nice is that there's development guides available there. And then if you look there, there's like a whole plethora of guides available that can help you with getting started with Vapor development on the server. Uh, because they say Swift on the server, but all samples that they do right now are mostly based on Vapor. So, and that's good information in there. So, uh, and this is up to date. And actually this page has been created like in the last two weeks, I think. And, uh, it has been a block item on the Swift.org site as well. And I mentioned it in my podcast, follow AppForce One in your podcast player of choice. Does that answer your question? Azam, what's your question? Um, Azam asks, what is the recommendation for deploying a Vapor project, mostly for like, testing and development purposes while well, you're getting started. But it used to be Heroku, but we all know Heroku will soon start charging money for their, uh, for their platforms. Uh, and what's very interesting about this site here, <laughs> there's a page on deployment, and it has a number of, probably hard to read because it's blue and black, but it has some guides available on how you can deploy to EC2 uh, as a Dockerized container to Fargate, Amazon, to DigitalOcean, Heroku, which is costing money, uh, Kubernetes and Docker, if any platform you like, and Google Cloud Platform. And I think the easiest will probably be right now still Heroku, even though it costs like seven bucks a month. And otherwise, I I'd look at DigitalOcean because they have, um, I don't know what to use for terminology, but they have like these pre-packaged projects available. You can just one click, one deployment, and you have a virtual machine available, which has a database and some infrastructure available so that you can run uh, Swift server code. So definitely check out the Swift.org site because there's a lot new and useful information there. I saw a third hand being raised. Azil. Um, uh, what's the um, what I did with my code, except, if, sorry, the question was, is this all for the Mac or does this also work for Linux, right? Uh, well, what I basically showed thus far, uh, everything should work uh, on the server end uh, if you do Swift development, except, of course, for the iOS uh, code base. 
And uh, yeah, it, it should just work on any platform that supports the, the Swift uh, compiler and runtime. And that's any Linux that has support for it on the Swift.org side. Uh, we just, of course, need to make sure that you, uh, that you use the right frameworks, not frameworks that actually use Apple-specific frameworks. So I think you don't have foundation available on uh, Swift on the server. You have something equivalent with a different name. It's almost the same. Uh, and of course, you cannot use like UI-based frameworks and some of the Apple-specific frameworks that are uh, like not open source. Sorry? Yeah, if you, uh, it will be in my last slide. I'm going to switch back to the slides in a bit. But uh, all the sample code, all the uh, links that you would need to just like have a look at this yourself will be available on the stream website. And I have it linked on a convenient site on my own site, appforce1.net slash idev. And you will have a landing page, including the slides that I have today, with all the, the samples uh, available as well. OK. I'm going to do my last bit of slides, because then I always like, like finishing my presentation on time, because it's like right before lunch, right? So we got started, and we finished. Um, basically, I did the wrap-up with the questions uh, just now. So I like showing animated GIFs. I'm not as GIF-heavy as uh, some other awesome presentation that did, but uh, if there's a cat person in the audience, uh, I think you'll like this one. So if there's no more questions, I'm going to finish up and uh, let you all go.